പ്രൈമറി റിപ്പോർട്ട് എന്നുള്ള അയച്ച Hello, Samra, did you say something? Okay.
Okay, students, uh, very good evening to all of you. It's almost half an hour. Uh, we had some delay in starting. Uh, I hope you have uh, done well in your medicine and surgery papers. And uh, I'd like to wish you all the best for the remaining papers that you have. So being the day before the exam, I thought instead of taking some topics in detail, I would just uh, uh, skim through all the topics and uh, how to plan your answers, you know, like talk about that. Uh, I would have preferred a two-way channel where there would be some questions asked and so that I could clear those doubts, but uh, that doesn't seem to be very possible now. Anyways, let's start without wasting much time. So the first thing I would like to tell you all is that you need to manage your time properly. Don't scramble at the last minute to finish off some some answers. Okay. Now it's quite possible that you know most of the questions that are on the paper, and uh, thinking I mean thinking of it in those terms, then you can plan your answers because you have about 180 minutes for 100 marks. So I suggest if you take around 25 minutes for your essay questions and 10 minutes for your short answers and diagrams. You would finish that in about an hour. Your short notes of four marks each, maybe you can take about eight minutes for each question. So that would be 40 minutes. And the other eight mark essays, you can spend about an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. So roughly, if you know the answers to all the questions, now what happens is you start writing what you know well. And then uh, if you go on writing for more than the time that is allotted, then you will not have time to write the other questions, right? So that should not happen. Now, if there are a couple of questions that you don't know, then of course you can spend that time, uh, spend that extra time for your essays or whichever other questions that you know well, right? Uh, you are given 10 minutes before you can actually start writing. So you utilize those 10 minutes to plan as to which ones you start writing first and so on. Now, the next thing that uh, I'd like to uh, remind you is that you have to manage your pages. You don't get as many pages as you want. So, you have about 52 pages. Now, some of you all write uh, very widely spaced. And then uh, last exam, uh, when I was a supervisor, I had somebody unable to finish the paper. No space for six questions, right? So, that should not happen. So, please manage your pages well, depending on... Uh, how uh, how spaced you write, how crammed you write. Now, don't, I wouldn't advise to cram up everything. You know, some people are so worried about the pages that they cram up every inch and every bit of the space. So that uh, that is disturbing to the examiner when they're correcting it, right? So it's better that you space it out a little. Don't need to write full, full sentences. Like when you're, suppose you're answering about what will you do with eclampsia. Then the patient is put on a bed with railings and the hands and feet are tight. So you just write that. Bed with railings, prevent a fall. You know, so you get more space to write and these things are written separately and uh, they are visible at once. Then you can use flowcharts, use diagrams. So when you use a flowchart, a lot of those sentences you need not write. Like for example, management will depend on the gestational age. So you write the gestational age is less than 24 weeks and you go right down as points then if it is between 24 to 34 then you write it like that and beyond 34 then you can write so you can fill up a lot more on page which is a little more you know visually uh, better and uh, it gives an idea that you know well right so these things are important write legibly do not scribble in such a way that it becomes difficult to read what you have written right draw diagrams where required and do not use too many abbreviations, only use the accepted ones. Like on examination, O bar E is fine. But some of the other things that you use when you would text your friend, no, that's not acceptable. Okay, so these things, what happens is when you see that on a paper, it sort of irritates the examiner. And you know, that's not really uh, good for you, right? So after that, uh, after this short in introduction, let's... Uh, go as to let's look at how to answer these questions okay so you have to look at the question and see how many marks are allotted to that question now your uh, 15 mark essay mostly will come with four or five stems each stem will have a mark allotted so if it is defined then we only expect the definition defined will be for one or two marks we only want the definition but the definition should be 
the definition that is given in the books, not something that you've thought out at that time, right? Um, then you might have like, what is the diagnosis? So if that is for one mark, you can just write antipartum hemorrhage, abruptio placenta. But if it, for, if it is for two marks, then what is your diagnosis? You can write a little more as to why you arrived at that diagnosis. A little more doesn't mean one whole page or anything, but maybe a brief paragraph because it's for one or two marks, right? Similarly, if there's a question like list the complications, then that will be for two or three marks. It will not be for too many marks. So list the complication means you need only list. Mention the uh, indications. So then you just mention the indications A list is enough. Mostly the marks that will be allotted will not be too much. It might be two or three marks. So accordingly, you can put maybe like if it's two marks, you put four or eight or whatever indications or complications as, as there are for the condition. Now, if it starts with describe, uh, describe the management or how will you manage, how will you investigate? Obviously, if the, the management questions uh, will have more um, weightage, right? So that will be five marks or seven marks, whatever. So when you start with management, if there is no separate question on investigations, you can just start with uh, what investigations you will do, how you will utilize those investigations for management. Okay. For example, preeclampsia, often you, are, uh, you will be asked, one of the stems will be, what are the investigations that you will send? And if that is for two marks, then you can just write CBC, RFT, LFT, uh, and, you know, like uh, PTINR or whatever. But if that is for four marks, just writing a few words is not going to fetch you four marks. So what do you need to do then? So you will say that you would like to do the CBC in that it is important to know what is a hemoglobin because if the hemoglobin is usually there is hemoconcentration and the hemoglobin may be 13 or 14 with a high hematocrit. If there is anemia, then it needs to be corrected before anything, before you go ahead with the obstetric management, right? The platelet count is important. If it is very low, then you're probably looking at the HELP syndrome. So thrombocytopenia means, again, the chance for bleeding is more. So when you are asked how to investigate and you are going to send a set of investigations, if it is for four marks, five marks and all that, we would like to know what you would do with these results, right? Don't just say that you will send CBC and then, you know, generally what happens is when you are asked a question as to how to investigate, you start from CBC and urinary and you go right up to PET scan and CT scan and stuff. So don't do that the relevant investigation that you will do for this patient and what you what you glean from the reports. So you would like to do urine album. If there is proteinuria, which is more than so and so, 300 milligram whatever per 24 hours, or the urine PCR is more than 0.3, then it is preeclampsia. Otherwise, it is gestational hypertension and the management will differ. You are doing the renal function test. If it is abnormal, then it implies that the renal damage has occurred or there is acute kidney injury. The management... Uh, it, it, this patient will be taken as severe preeclampsia. Okay, so these are examples. So whenever you are uh, doing an investigation for whatever, if it is an AB, AUB case also, when you do the HP, then you will say, I want to know the HP because if there is anemia, it shows that there has been heavy menstrual bleeding. Secondly, I will need to manage the anemia. Hmm? Uh, you're, you would like to do a USD for that patient with abnormal uterine bleeding. The ultrasound scan, I will look for one. The, whether there are any fibroids, the, the myometric, whether there are any fibroids, whether these fibroids are subendometrial, what is the size? Are they likely to be the cause of the bleeding? Then I would like to look at the endometrial thickness. In a premenopausal patient, less than a millimeter means I might need to look, might need to do a sampling. So just don't list the investigations. Tell us what are the normal, what is the abnormal, and what you would like to do if it is abnormal. Just put it as one sentence each so that we know that you've thought about it, right? Similarly, what are the complications? So if it is list the complications, two marks, you just put a list. But if it is what are the complications and it is four marks, uh, then with each complication, you can just write. So again, you have to look at the question, see what is the weightage, uh, what are the marks that are allotted and answer accordingly. Now, after this much about uh, generally about answering the question paper, I'll just take a look at some briefly at some of the topics. Now, I, I don't know how far taking a class like this on the day before the exam works but for whatever it's worth now uh, some of the long questions now i have th i thought that uh, we could just look at some of the essay questions that you would be given so antipartum hemorrhage is one of the favorites so your your main question would be 
a 32 year old uh, primary gravida or second gravida with 34 weeks of gestation comes to the labor room with history of bleeding pv and pain or no pain pain may be mentioned pain may not be mentioned right the fhs is 132 per minute and there might be some clinical examination findings on examination so if there was no pain in the history then the clinical examination findings might say that the uterus is corresponding to 34 weeks of gestation the fetal hearts are present and there is continuing bleeding well, how then the rest of the questions will come what is your diagnosis what is the differential diagnosis what investigations will you do or how will you manage and so on and so forth right so here what you have to know i mean i think this is something that you all know abruption is likely to be history of pain the shock the amount of bleeding that is seen to the exterior the patient signs symptoms clinical findings are likely to be disproportionate because some of the bleeding is likely to be concealed okay whereas in placenta previa it's a painless bleeding and the signs and symptoms that the degree of shock is going to be proportionate to the amount of bleeding that the patient talks about so uh, in placenta previa you have the conservative management so if you're going to say uh, how will you manage you can say that depending on uh, i will take all the first the initial general measures that you take when a patient comes with bleeding you will send all the investigations you will look to see whether the fetal hearts are good you will do an ultrasound maybe and then you will if the patient's bleeding subsides or you want to replace the blood and the components if the bleeding is lim self limiting and there is no further episode of bleeding the fetal heart is good and the maternal condition is good since she is only 34 weeks i would like to give antenatal corticosteroids and uh, put her on the mcafee's regime okay you examine her and watch for any other problems and any further episodes of bleeding you would have to do a cesarean section when you do right cesarean section then you can uh, put a list as to what are the um, precautions that you will take while doing a cesarean section for placenta previa obviously you're going to expect bleeding so you need to have blood ready you need to have uh, a senior person doing it uh, you can write a couple of sentences about uh, what are the you know like where you will take the incision has to be you cannot cut through the placenta so you have to have a placental localization and either go below or go above the placenta level cut through the membranes deliver the baby and uh, deliver the baby and uh, you can then post operative what problems that can occur give the blood transfusion component transfusion etc right whereas in a patient with abruption how will you manage there because <coughs> abruption uh, results more in fetal risks and you can get an iud very fast then depending on generally the the uh, the mode of management is termination so immediate termination has to be done how would you terminate would you like to do a cesarean section or would you like to permit a vaginal delivery so depending on what you your uh, what uh, clinical situation has been given to you in the stem you will decide what is to be done right so if the patient is a multi gravida para 3 gravida 4 para 3 l3 with many previous deliveries and she is now in active labor cervix has say taken up uh, 2 or 3 cm if they've given the pv findings or you will write that if the patient is a multi para who has had previous deliveries and is in labor and delivery is imminent then i would like to augment with oxytocin and uh, conduct delivery okay meanwhile you would like to replace all the blood and the components fast because what bleeding you see to the exterior there might be even more concealed hemorrhage so you will have to straight away order two pints of uh, prbc is two pints of ffp if the patient is likely to go in for coagulation failure okay so that is how you will write or if it is a primary gravida whose cervix uh, whose bishop score is very unfavorable then uh, because the abruption may progress and might result in fetal death i would like to do an immediate cesarean section so this is how you will uh, manage the question on antepartum hemorrhage depending on what the uh, question is right then the other causes uh, if if you have a differential diagnosis or list the other causes you will uh, you will write about vasa previa local lesions at all etc now why i have written remember it's third trimester <coughs> often we find that when you get a question like this that a primary gravid at 34 weeks has come with bleeding pv what are the differential diagnosis some even in the final year people tend to write threatened miscarriage or incomplete abortion and all that so please remember those are 
in the first and second trimester before the period of viability. Once it is beyond the period of viability and there is bleeding, then it is antepartum hemorrhage and the causes are placenta previa and abruption, which is what mostly you will be asked about, except for small questions about the rest, right? Um, prevention, if any, like in, in this, there's not much in, with regard to prevention, but any question that you have, if there's anything about prevention, you please put one paragraph about prevention. The other question that can be asked frequently is postpartum hemorrhage. So postpartum hemorrhage, again, your stem will be that uh, a 25-year-old or, or a 32-year-old para 3L3 just had a normal delivery and now she is bleeding profusely. Her pulse is 120, her BP is uh, 90 systolic and she's looking very pale. How will you manage? So how will you manage? Here again, as I said, prevention. So uh, the first thing that you should write is that AMTSL should be done for every patient in order to prevent PPH because PPH is one of the uh, commonest causes of even maternal mortality. So you can have that bad effects, right? So now once you uh, once you mention that or you put it somewhere and you don't have to write it at the beginning itself, but somewhere in the management or anywhere you can put the preventive aspects, right? So now this patient, if you're talking about that she's undergone a normal delivery and now she's bleeding profusely, how will you start with your answer? This is a, a postpartum hemorrhage, which is defined as so much blood loss over the more than 500 after a normal delivery or more than 1000 ml after a cesarean section, right? So uh, the commonest cause is atonic. So the first thing I would like to do is institute general measures in order to take care of the general condition. So the, the IV line is already there. You start fluids fast. You will put in a catheter. You will palpate the, the uterus to see whether the uterus is contracted. If it most often, because atonic PPH is, uh, is the reason in almost 70-80% of the time. So most often the uterus will be flabby. In which case you continue the massage, you do a bimanual massage, you call for help and get the other people to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, push IV fluids fast, collect blood for investigations, rush to the blood bank to get your blood and components, somebody else puts in a catheter, mm, the other person informs the bystanders, consent is taken for any further procedures that need to be done. And the most, the, the fastest thing, that the Im most immediate measure that you would take to reduce the amount of bleeding is to put in the transvaginal uterine artery clamp or to put in a panicard suction, uh, the suction cannula, right? Uh, panicker rams suction cannula. So once that is done, the amount of bleeding, the uh, the immediate measure is taken. Meanwhile, the transfusion is uh, given, the PRBCs, the FFP, etc. is started. And then you look for other causes, right? Then you manage and see whether the bleeding subsides and accordingly. So you will have to then, if the bleeding subsides, then this is what you will do. If it doesn't subside, so that can come as a flow chart. So that will Reduce the amount of time you require to write as well. Don't write full, full sentences, right? Now, if the same way, similarly, on a, the initial part of it, if the uterus is not contract, I mean, if the uterus is well contracted, then the other next common cause is traumatic PPH. So, you would say that you would like to, uh, <coughs> the general measures remain the same. Call for help all remains the same. Immediately, you would like to have an inspection set. And uh, if the patient is in a lithotomy position, you would like to look for cervical tears, vaginal tears, extension of episiotomy, epi extension of the episiotomy, where you cannot see the apex. That means it could even be a rupture uterus, right? So you write all that. And then, of course, your surgical management comes into play. Now, your atonic PPH, when you started, you're doing all these measures. If the uterus continues to remain atonic and uh, the bleeding continues, then you would like to take the patient to the theater and you can do your b lynch you can do your Heyman sutures, you might need to do a hysterectomy if it's a multi parents woman. So you put all that as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So I don't think there's uh, time now also to go into all the details, but uh, you are expected to write all these things. Now, one mistake that I've commonly seen when I'm correcting papers is when the question is about adherent placenta or when you all introduce adherent placenta as a cause of PPH. Now, with adherent placenta, um, what usually is the, uh, what happens is that a patient with previous CS and a low-lying placenta, you have to suspect that the placenta may be adherent. So, you have to do a dedicated scan at around 20 to 30 weeks to look for any features suggestive of an adherent placenta, whether it's accreta, increta or percreta. If it is so, then the patient has to be referred to, so that's early diagnosis, referred to a tertiary center. When the patient is referred to a tertiary center, what do we do there? 
Do we wait for delivery and PPH? No, we don't do that. We, the, we post these women for an elective cesarean hysterectomy. Right? So at 34 to 36 weeks, if there is bleeding earlier, if there is no bleeding, 34 to 36. Why? Because you're going to do a hysterectomy. You want the baby to be reasonably mature and have a reasonable chance at survival. So rather than doing it at 32, if the patient is fine, you leave her alone and do it at 34 or 35, 36, depending on uh, depending on the uh, characteristics of the patient, right? And whether she has bleeding or not and so on. So an elective cesarean hysterectomy is done. So what do you do? You do a classical cesarean section. So often I find that the students do not write that the hysterectomy has to be a classical cesarean section. So you do a classical cesarean section, deliver the baby, do not touch the placenta and proceed with the hysterectomy. So your uh, management is how to reduce the blood loss during the hysterectomy. You can use a vasopressin in injection. You can do an internal iliac artery ligation, but it is difficult. We use a common aortic clamp nowadays, though I don't think maybe the undergraduate students don't know that we use that. But uh, generally, we need to take measures to finish the hysterectomy fast. And uh, if it is a percreta, the chances of it having invaded into the bladder are much more. And uh, the, while dissecting the lower segment, because you need to push the bladder down to complete the hysterectomy. So when you try to push the bladder down inadvertently, you may uh, land up with a cystotomy or a bladder injury, which then needs to be sutured. So sometimes you need surgeons, you need urologists to help you to do the hysterectomy. So you have to mention all that when you're talking about it. Often we find that people talk about their in placenta and then you say that there is PPH and then you do this and then you do a hysterectomy. So that's not how it goes, right? And then you might have a question as to what are the complications of either APH or PPH. So you can have all the complications related to blood loss, right? So patient is in shock. She can go for renal problems, uh, ischemic hepatitis, multi-organ dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to write all those aspects there. Now, um, it's, it's just a one-way uh, traffic here. I'm just talking. I'm hoping that if there are any doubts, uh, you can please maybe put up on the chat box so that it's communicated to me. Um, so this is one common question that you would be asked, bleeding, either antepartum or postpartum. Uh, the next common aspect, I mean, long question that you can expect is a preeclampsia. So here again, I think preeclampsia is often, very often discussed in all the classes. And I, I didn't really think that you need to do a lot about it. Uh, again, what are the questions that you can, that can be asked? So when the BP is high, how will you manage the patient initially? So obviously the BP is high and the recheck BP is high, then the patient needs to be admitted. Once the patient is admitted, depending on the severity. So what clinical situation you have been given? BP is 170, 110 at 32 weeks of pregnancy in a primary gravida. Now, what would you do? Obviously, with the BP of 170, 110, the first thing that you would like to do is give her antihypertensives. So then you say that the patient's BP needs to be controlled. I would like to give antihypertensives. You can put a list of what antihypertensives you start with. With the BP of 170, 110, 170, 120 and all, you need to give IV Lebetlol for rapid control of the blood pressure. So you put your IV Lebetlol dose. I would like to re re review the BP every 10 minutes. And if it does not come down within 20 minutes, I would like to repeat the dose uh, is given. And again, repeat dose till a maximum of um, 300 milligram of Lebetlol that you give. And uh, otherwise, suppose you say, suppose it is said that the BP of 150-90, she's seen in the OP at 34 weeks and her BP is 150-90. Then, of course, you don't have to describe this first. So there what you would describe that I would like to reach the BP, confirm that it is high, start her on oral antihypertensives, right? So you would start with either Nicardia, Nifidipine or Lebetlol. And then you can give us a dose and you can tell us how you would titrate the tablet. Then I would also like to do immediately in all these women, you will be sending a set of investigations. So what investigations would you like to do? I would like to do all these investigations. Why you want to do? That is where I said you want to decide whether it is gestational hypertension or Preeclampsia. If it is preeclampsia, you want to decide if there is AK, if there's already renal uh, renal function is deranged, or if there is uh, HELP syndrome, or if there is thrombocytopenia, then she goes into severe preeclampsia. So your diagnosis of severe preeclampsia warrant, warrants immediate termination. So you can put that as a flowchart that I would like to do these investigations and tell us why you want to do all these investigations. Again, that depends on the number of marks that has been allotted to whatever stem you have been asked. 
Now, you are not going to be asked to describe the entire problems in preeclampsia in one question. So, your five questions, as I've seen in the surgery papers and the medicine papers, um, they're like, I mean, they're quite simple stems. So, each stem for one mark, two marks, touches on one aspect. So, depending on the marks, I think you should. Um, now, uh, how do you know how much time to spend for two marks, how much time to spend for four marks? I gave you a rough uh, idea, right? So, if you have an, uh, an essay question which has 15 marks, the initial one and two marks will hardly take you any time to write. Okay. So, for four marks, how much to write? You, you can do an exercise. You just, some answer that you know very well, you write it down quickly and see how much you write within four minutes or five minutes. Then you know how much to write for those four marks. Anyways, do not uh, write too much for a question which has only two or three marks. We cannot give you anything more than one and a half or two marks for a question. You know, two, two and a half, maybe two, two and one fourth for a question that is three marks. Right? So, um, be aware of that. Your short note of four marks or five marks, you know a lot. Writing everything down and wasting time does not, will, we, we cannot give you anything more than three and a half or four for that five mark question. Right? So, be aware of that. So, whenever you are asked about preeclampsia, again, when you when the question comes as to what is the management, you can say that the management depends on gestational age and severity. So, uh, severe preeclampsia, whatever the gestational age, you would like to terminate. Except in some, quest, some situations where the baby is like 31, 32 weeks and the mother is not that bad and you want to give the baby a little better chance at survival and wait for a week under good care of a tertiary, in a tertiary care center, right, where the investigations are repeated and any sign of the mother going in for problems, you will uh, terminate. Now, if if the baby is very remote from term, then if it is severe preeclampsia, obviously there is no point in waiting, so you would like to terminate, right. Similarly, uh, gestational hypertension, you can wait up to, if the mother is fine, the baby is fine, you can wait up to around 37, 38 weeks. If it is non-severe preeclampsia, again, uh, you would like to monitor the patient and wait till about 37, 38 weeks. But you need to repeat the investigations. Any woman with gestational hypertension or non-severe preeclampsia can uh, go in for complications soon. So, you can't be complacent about it, right? So, when you write management depends on these two aspects, then you have to mention three aspects of management for all these women. That is, one is control of hypertension, the other is prophylaxis of convulsions. All of you all are very good at writing about Maxwell, so continue doing that. But don't forget the obstetric management. So, you write so much about antihypertensives and Maxwell that you forget to mention what to do with the patient, right? So, when you write obstetric management, what is it? What is it that you have to discuss? You must discuss when to terminate. Okay, so that depending on your GI and severity and all, you've decided when to terminate. How to terminate? So, how to terminate means, would you like to do a cesarean section or would you like to like her to have a vaginal delivery? So, what are the indications for cesarean section? You must write them, right? And if not, and you're planning a vaginal delivery, then how you go about induction of labor? So, you would look at the bishop score and depending on the bishop score, you would choose whatever uh, mode of induction, right? So, depending on the marks again, you can just put an outline or you write something in detail. Um, okay. Then about the complications of preeclampsia, I think we did just discussed it earlier, the maternal complications or fetal complications. Depending on the marks, please write a couple of sentences more. If the marks are more, then write a little more about each of these complications. Don't just give a list. If it is for four marks, just listing seven or eight complications will not give you four marks, right? Unless you're very short of time. Another question that can be asked, previous cesarean section. Uh, mostly it is more for your uh, practical exams but I think sometimes you can because now it's a 100 mark question we don't really have a prototype as to what all can be asked for 100 marks we need to really touch on almost many aspects right so again this question would be that a uh, uh, second gravida G G either a G2P1 L1 uh, with history of previous is there in the first delivery uh, for an indication of whatever comes to the labor room with pain in abdomen at 38 weeks or 39 weeks. She has so many contractions and her PV findings are so and so. How will you proceed? So, how will you proceed when you ask how will you proceed? You have to um, say, just tell us that this patient is a case of previous years. These are the problems that she can have. One, if she goes in for labor, there is a risk of scar rupture. How much? It is less than 1%. And that depends on whether it's a lower segment or a classical. So, is it a classical cesarean section? Then, 
So because of this and because if there is a scar rupture, the maternal complications are very much and the fetus also uh, mostly will, lie, will end up with a mortality. So in order to prevent that, you have to have uh, a well-selected group of women. Okay. So uh, once you said that what are the what, why the, this previous cesarean section is a high risk pregnancy, then you can go on to the the the, the ways that these this woman can be managed. Either she can go for a VBAC or she will need an, a cesarean section. So you tell us why, in which cases you would like to keep for a VBAC. So you say that this woman is a second gravidus. She has not had a previous delivery. That previous baby, the indication for that section was first degree CPD failed trial. Uh, and that baby was 3.8 kg and on, uh, on examination at this time she does not have any other complications but her baby is you know, clinically if the baby is big then I would like to do this. If it is an average size baby I would like to do this. So here again your flow charts can come into play. right? But if in the history they have mentioned something which is suggestive of you know requiring another section then you can say that then you have to write the pros and cons. What are the advantages of VBAC? What are the, advan what are the disadvantages of VBAC? Again, you have to write what are the advantages of a cesarean section and what are the disadvantages of a cesarean section. You can have an elective cesarean section and you can have an emergency cesarean section. So this lady is come in labor, so it's going to be a semi-emergency cesarean section if you're planning to do one. But if, if you say, if the question is that she's at 36 weeks, how will you discuss with her a plan? So some of the questions that I saw in the model question paper are like really little in the sense they are very practically oriented questions, you know, like how you would do. So discuss with her a plan for delivery. Suppose you get something like that. Then you would write that these are the things, these are the modes that she has. Uh, in in these, in cases where she's had a previous vaginal delivery and she has no other complications and her indication for the cesarean section was a fetal distress or a breach presentation, which are compatible with the back, right? And uh, if... Um, um, she has a no other um, no other comorbidities and she has a an average size baby in cephalic presentation the head is well fixed into the pelvis and the bishop score is favorable then she is a candidate to go for VBAC. if these uh, criteria have not been met if any of these criteria are you know like against like the previous indications are non compatible or she has another comorbidity like she's got hypertension now or she's got gestational diabetes which is uncontrolled or she has a very big baby, or she has a very growth-restricted fetus, both of which are not really very good. Or, and she, or she has a mobile head, which is very floating, which has not gone into the pelvis at all. And the cervix is very unfavorable. Then in all these cases, then it is unlikely that VBAC will be successful. It may be better to talk to her and decide regarding elective cesarean section. So this time, you must also talk about whether you will discuss regarding the plan for sterilization, whether she wants a sterilization surgery or not. If she doesn't want, then you would like to explain to her that when she comes as for a third in a third pregnancy with a history of two previous years, she is at risk for developing adherent placenta and might even require a hysterectomy. So this is how you will discuss a patient with previous years. Now, uh, I, I don't know if there are any questions that are coming up, whether you have any other issues that you want to discuss in this. Um, Samra, are there any, any questions in the chat box? Okay. Then, uh, then the other thing that you can have is a primary with mobile head at term. So if you have a primary gravida, uh, that the question would be like a 36 year old or I mean 25 year old primary gravida at 38 weeks of pregnancy has come to the labor room with contractions which are like 1 to 2 or 2 to 3 per 10 minutes each lasting for 45 seconds <coughs> and uh, on examination uh, around 34 weeks the fundal height is corresponding to around 34 weeks the head is mobile. Four fifth, five fifths of the head is palpable. It is mobile and it is flexed, right? So how will you proceed? Now in this patient, what is it that you are going to discuss? What is it that they want to discuss? They want to discuss about cephalopelvic disproportion, right? So again, the, depending on the stems, what is uh, what do you think is a problem for this patient? Then, because the head is mobile, it's likely that the cervix is unfavorable. There could be cephalopelvic disproportion. And this stem might also be mentioned that the patient is 145 centimeters tall or 146 centimeters tall. So you can also say that she is a short stature. 
So she is likely to have a pelvis which is smaller and might have chances of cephalopelvic disproportion. What stems that you are likely to ask? What are the risk factors? What are the problems that she may have? Okay, and how will you examine? How will you know that uh, this lady has got CPD? So again, you talk about your general examination. You talk about the pelvis examination. How will you know that the pelvis is normal? Uh, so you have to look at the sacral promontory. You have to look at the curvature of the sacrum, uh, the curvature from above downwards and from side to side. You have to look at the uh, sacrosciatic notch, the ischial spines, the lateral wall of the pelvis, whether, it's, uh, whether it is convergent. Look at the ischial spines to give you an idea of the mid pelvis. Then for the um, outlet, you have to look at the subpubic angle and what is the distance between the ischial tuberosities, right? So you talk about the assessment of the pelvis. Then you talk about the Monroe Carmelis, uh, the, the, the maneuver where we will try to push the head down and see whether uh, there is evidence of CPD. Now, none of these are uh, hard and fast when you do it before the patient is in labor. So you would do it when it, she is in active labor. Then you will, how will you manage labor in this woman? So you will... You will talk about all the other aspects of uh, managing a woman in the first uh, first stage of labor, giving fluids, monitoring the BP, the pulse, the fetal hearts, um, seeing that she is having clear fluids. Okay, but if she's at a risk that you that you would like to have uh, that she would need a cesarean section because uh, she's going to have first degree CPD, you can talk about restricting fluids. And then you will be looking for meconium, and you will be. Uh, what are the you will be looking for signs that tell you that this patient is having cephalopelvic disproportion? So, if there's a formation of a cap port and there's too much of molding, okay, then you will be thinking that she's having first degree CPD and you would like to do a cesarean section. Then, what is second degree CPD when you're trying to push the head into the pelvis? If it's totally overriding the symphysis fibers and not entering the pelvis at all, then it's likely to be second degree CPD, in which case there is no point inducing labor. You might need to do an elective cesarean section. Okay, so this is about primary with mobile head at term. Um, then the other questions that you may be asked uh, in obstetrics, you could be asked about a breech presentation. So if you have a primary gravida at 38 weeks of gestation who's come in labor and on examination, on per abdominal examination, you find that it's a breech presentation. How will you go about it? So again, in this, uh, depending on the stems, what is your diagnosis or like what are the ki kinds of uh, breach presentations in, uh, you know, how would you proceed with labor? Why would you like to do a cesarean? So primary with breach at term, mostly a cesarean section. So how much percentage of women have breach at term? That's around 3 to 4 percent. How would you proceed with the delivery? Then you would say that you'd like to do an elective cesarean section. And then you explain why you want to do an elective cesarean section. So with breach, it's that inverted triangle. So you have the uh, the small body coming out early and the big head might get stuck at the brim or, you know, that there could be fetopelvic disproportion and then it is difficult to do a cesarean section. The perinatal mobility, mortality, everything for the baby is more in a breech delivery and therefore you would like to do a cesarean section. And then you can tell us a little bit about what are the maneuvers that can be used at cesarean section. Now, suppose it is a multi, gravida 3, para 2 with two previous full-term normal deliveries of babies that are 3.2 and 3.4 kgs which she has delivered and now she has come with a breach and she is in labor and the cervix is favorable. Now, what will you do? Then you can talk about the Zetrichni andro scoring system which tells you that this woman may be, you may be able to keep for uh, delivery and then you can tell us about all the maneuvers how you will wait with master, masterly inactivity till the uh, and watchful expectancy till the baby delivers up to the umbilicus. So your assisted breech delivery, then how you would manage the delivery of the uh, of the arms, the head. Okay, so you have to tell us all these maneuvers that are there. Transfer slide may not really come as a question, as a big question, because there's really not much to do about except do a cesarean section. <laughs> it's more for the postgraduates. Um, so I think these are the questions that will mostly be asked about obstetrics. Uh, in gynec, uh, it's actually past 7. We were supposed to do 6 to 7. Uh, do we need to stop at this time? Uh, if Samra is around, I would uh, like to be given an idea as to how much more time we have. Um,
Okay, so we just go about for maybe another 20 or 30 minutes. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the next topics, I mean, the Gaine questions that you would be asked mostly, uh, these are the couple of topics. Uh, when it was a 40 mark question, it was invariably either abnormal uterine bleeding, post uh, 40 mark paper, post menopausal bleeding, or one of the uh, malignancies, right? But now that it's a 100 mark question and you have two long questions, two essays. So some of the other topics that might come as uh, essays are primary infertility, primary amenorrhea, and menopause. I'm just taking a guess, but uh, that's those are the questions that are likely to be essay questions. So when you're talking of abnormal uterine bleeding, I don't have, but I, uh, because of lack of time, I didn't really make slides for these. Uh, but uh, the question would come as a 45-year-old lady. So premenopausal, a perimenopausal woman, right? 45-year-old lady with history of heavy menstrual bleeding or prolonged uh, menstrual bleeding or heavy and prolonged menstrual bleeding or frequent cycles over the last one year, two years, okay, with LMP on so and so date. Has come to the OP with dizziness or fatigue hmm? or fainting spells or bleeding PV since 10 days, 12 days. So how will you manage this patient? And again, depending on the stems, you what is what is your so with AUB now, it's not very difficult to write your answers because your classification is there, your FIGO system one, FIGO system two, FIGO system one, which tell you what is normal bleeding pattern. So anything which is a not in that uh, not in the normal pattern, that means the number of days of flow more than five to eight, the cycle uh, duration, which is coming freak more frequent than twenty four days. Or it's irregular if the interval is like more than nine days between the shortest and the longest period. Okay, and the amount of flow is very heavy. Uh, so these are the things that will tell you that this is abnormal uterine bleeding. So cyclicity, frequency, duration, or the volume of flow. If any of these are abnormal, then it's called as abnormal uterine bleeding, as you all know. And the cause is palm coin, right? So that is FIGO system 2. So when you talk about how will you uh, take a clinical history of this patient or those could be the questions that are asked. You have 15 marks, right? So how will you take a clinical history of this patient or how will you investigate this patient? Or there could be one question would be like, um, what are the causes of AUB? So you just talk about the palm coin, structural, non-structural, and you put, the, uh, you put that whole table down, right? Now, how will you take a clinical history? When you're talking of the history, you just think about palm coin. So you say that polyp, no? Polyp. Adenomyosis, leomyoma, malignancy with endometrial hyperplasia. So if it's a polyp, what would this patient have? Apart from heavy menstrual bleeding, she would have intermenstrual bleeding. She might have discharge PV, which could be foul smelling. So you say that you're looking for those things. Then you talk about adenomyosis. What are the other features that will tell you on history that it could be adenomyosis? She could be having severe dysmenorrhea, right? Or, or she might be having associated endometriosis and severe dysperionia, apart from the heavy menstrual bleeding. So you go step by step, leomyoma, what are the symptoms she could have? She could have a mass in the abdomen or she could have urinary symptoms or she could have some other pressure symptoms, right? Apart from the bleeding. Then you can also say that if it's a submucous myoma, the bleeding is likely to be in more. If it is not a submucous myoma, if it's a subserous or intramural, she may not actually present with abnormal uterine bleeding, right? So uh, <coughs> you, you can go as per the palm coin classification and systematic way you can take the history. Similarly, your examination. So whenever you're examining, you see that apart from the, from the general examination, you will, you know, talk about pallor, you will talk about thyroid dysfunction because coagulopathy, you know, ovulatory dysfunction, endocrine prob endometrial problems, you know, iatrogenic problems, you have to also ask whether she's being taken tablets irregularly. So all these, when you go systematically, you'll be able to write what are the history, what history you're going to elicit, what are the examination features and how will you manage. So uh, sometimes there might be a clue as to what the problem is. Like they might mention that she has a mass which is 14 to 16 week size. Then you're going to say that is either fibroid or adenomyosis. And accordingly, then she will require mostly surgical management, right? Sometimes they might say that the, that the uterus is not palpable per abdomen. So that means the uterus is likely to be normal size. Of course, you will mention somewhere that you would like to do a per vaginal examination, assess the size of the uterus and see whether there's a small submucous fibroid. 
which could be causing the bleeding. If not, if the uterus is then your investigations. No, you will do your ultrasound. When when you write, I will do like to do an ultrasound. You write on what all you will see on the ultrasound. You look at the myometrium, you look for fibroids. Look at the endometrium, you look for the thickness. You look at the adnexa, you look for any abnormal ovarian masses. Right, and depending on that, you will treat. So if it's a leomyoma, then you talk about medical management, surgical management. Okay, so whenever the patient, whenever they talk, talk to you, if the question is how will you manage this patient, your first thing is immediate management. Okay, so immediate management is what patient has come to you with bleeding for so many days, you would like to give her something to address that bleeding, right? So you can start with your uh, NSAIDs and tranexamic acid and you would look at the hemoglobin and maybe start her on iron tablets. If she has pain, you give her something for the pain. Hmm? Then your examination findings will tell you some of the immediate problems. If it's a polyp, then obviously if there's a polyp in the vagina, then you need to post her for a polypectomy. You know, giving no other things are going to help you out, right? Then you would like to do an ultrasound uh, to find out what to, to aid in the diagnosis after your examination. And you would like to do some blood blood examinations, which would include a CBC or TFT, maybe a prolactin, just to look for all the ovarian dis ovulatory dysfunctions, right? So then you write, then you when you when you write about uh, doing a CBC, you would say you would like to know the HP estimation. If it is low, it confirms that she's having heavy menstrual bleeding, and you would like to give her iron to correct. Right? Oh, that reminds me that we forgot about anemia and pregnancy. We just maybe if we have time, we'll just talk about it later. So that is how you will discuss abnormal uterine bleeding. Now suppose the next after a couple of questions on general, the last question may be, how would you like to manage fibroids? Suppose the lady is having fibroids, how would you like to manage? Or suppose this is a case of adenomyosis, how would you like to manage? So then your next questions would be answer would be related to that. So with fibroids, what is your management? We can go for medical management. So every, whenever you ask for medical management of fibroids, I find that people write GNRH analogs and all first. So now we have other medical management that can be given. Apart from the NSAIDs and tranexamic acid, which will help you to control the symptoms, you have uh, you have your selective progesterone receptor molecules. Eh? You have your mephigest and you have ulipristol acetate, which may be given to reduce, try and reduce the size of fibroids if it is not very big. And if it is causing pressure symptoms or causing some, uh, if there is severe anemia, what are the indications for surgery? Okay, so indications for surgery, large fibroids, symptomatic fibroids, hmm, cervical fibroids. So these are all that you cannot really do a medical management. Then surgery, what surgery? Would you like to do a myomectomy? Would you like to do a hysterectomy? So you can write what are the indications for myomectomy. Younger patient wants to cons conserve the uterus who has one or two single, you know, like uh, two, uh, less number of large myomas. Whereas a lady, Paris woman who has tried failed medical treatment and who has multiple large fibroids, then you cannot do a myomectomy. Uh, she has completed her family, so you would like to do a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. Then at that time, you can even mention when you're doing a hysterectomy whether you would like to keep the ovaries or not, you know, remove the ovaries. So depending on the age, suppose they have said it's a 42-year-old lady and you're saying hysterectomy, you should mention there that you would like to conserve the ovaries because ovarian conservation is required for the lady to have, uh, otherwise she will go in for all the um, complications related to menopause, right? So this is what I can think about when we talk about abnormal uterine bleeding. Then you could have uh, another another set of questions regarding postmenopausal bleeding. So uh, your question would be a 60-year-old or a 62-year-old or a 58-year-old postmenopausal woman P3 L3, that means she has had three vaginal, three deliveries before. Maybe they might write vaginal deliveries or they might write cesarean section. Comes with history of menopausal since so many years, five years, eight years, ten years. Comes with history of bleeding PV. Uh, they might some they might add that it is associated, uh, she had history of foul smelling discharge for a couple of months, followed by bleeding PV. What does that uh, point towards? So, foul-smelling vaginal discharge followed by bleeding PV, which is not very uh, much, uh, you know, occasional and recurrent bouts of, um, you know, minimal bleeding or moderate amount of bleeding. It points towards the CA cervix because the foul-smelling discharge tells you that probably there's a polyp or polypoidal growth or a, a malignant growth of the cervix. Now, suppose they say that uh, when they describe that lady, when they say that 70-year-old obese lady, 
who is on antihypertensives and is having diabetes has come and menopausal since 20 years comes with a sudden episode of heavy bleeding tb for four or five days that and they have not mentioned anything about a discharge and all that then that points towards a corpus cancer syndrome what is a corpus cancer syndrome which is the association of hypertension obesity and c endometrial so in that case what is your diagnosis you will write that the my diagnosis is c endometrial because so and so so what is your diagnosis one mark maybe c endometrial is enough but if it is two marks I, as i told you earlier a couple of lines as to why you arrived at the diagnosis is is welcome right um so once you have the diagnosis then what is your differential diagnosis so obviously you uh, with just that uh, a two line history you cannot always come to a single diagnosis so what is your differential diagnosis that should come in the order of possibility right what is more likely you put up and what is less likely you put down so uh, any of these women could have a polyp okay an infected polyp just like for ca cervix you would get more or less the same um uh, same symptoms if it's an infected polyp that is coming out huh? it could be a leiomyoma which has prolapsed come out as a polyp and then it's got infected you're going to have uh, pulse swelling discharge you're going to have bleeding period okay, any local lesions can also uh, give rise to um again what you say similar uh, episodes of bleeding pp and all so your differential diagnosis then how will you manage so again management or what investigations you will do obviously apart from a proper bimanual pelvic examination the next thing is you're going to do an ultrasound when you write about an ultrasound if you are looking at a normal size uterus you need a transvaginal ultrasound if it's a large uterus or for anything they've mentioned as a mass in abdomen which is so many big size then you need a transabdominal plus a transvaginal okay and as i said whenever you talk about ultrasound mention what all you are going to look for what all you want to see right uh, so then your uh, then depending on what are your aspects so how will you manage ca cervix if it is a 4 and 5 mark question i think we just want outline the 7 or 8 marks for management of ca cervix then you may write about the staging and for each stage what you will give if they have particularly mentioned one stage and i don't think you need write about the entire staging or about the management for all the stages so that's what i said look at the question and answer to the point because if you write a lot of unrelated stuff you are not really going to get much of a credit for that again you have to be very careful as to not write something glaringly wrong uh for example very often i find that see endometrium 78 year old lady with post menopausal bleeding pb and she has come with all that you write a lot of stuff and then you write at the end management because she has completed her family you are going to do a hysterectomy is the reason why you are going to do hysterectomy in a see endometrium because she has completed her family at 79 does it make sense at 79 whether or not she has completed her family are you planning that she would complete her family now no so that does that's not important that's not the reason why she is having c endometrium which is why you are going to do a hysterectomy don't talk about family completion and stuff but as if you're talking about a 35 year old lady who has got a large <laughs> or multiple large fibroids with abnormal uterine bleeding or a big mass it's a 20 26 week size mass in the abdomen so you have to do a hysterectomy right now in this woman if she had not completed her family suppose she had four or five fibroids and the 18 or 20 weeks it's not as though you can't do a myomectomy so being 35 and having not completed her family she is a candidate for myomectomy but suppose she had completed her family she is p2l2 she is 36 years her last child is around 9 years 10 years and she is sterilized okay so if it's a multiple fibroid you may not go ahead and do a myomectomy you may think of doing a hysterectomy okay just remember that all over the world we are into a saving the uterus campaign so don't do a hysterectomy at the drop of a hat hmm? don't do a hysterectomy just because she's completed her family so don't write things like that now hmm? uh some other glaring mistakes i can't really think of them now but when you have some uh, mostly it occurs in the short notes okay so lots of right things but one absolutely wrong stuff which goes totally against the grain right then you you lose credit for that so be careful when you write so ca endometrium if you are writing uh, obviously you would like to do a staging laparotomy and what all you will do at the staging laparotomy a total examination you will do a thbso you will like to do a pelvic lymphadenectomy right and a nomentectomy especially if it is uh, like papillary or whatever so ca cervix 
up to what stage you can do surgery beyond what stage you would like to go for radiotherapy okay so if it is mostly you will be uh, it will be described as stage 1a 1 or 1b 1 where you can do a surgery in that case you will say that because you know uh, I, I suppose you all know that for early stages of CA cervix, surgery as well as radiotherapy both have more or less the same five-year survival rates. So in which patient would you choose surgery and in which, which patient would you choose radiotherapy? There you have a choice. Beyond stage B2 and all, if you have a large tumor which has uh, invaded the vagina or the, or, or the parametrium, then doing a surgery is not uh, feasible. So those women will all go in for radiotherapy. But the earlier stages... A lady who is a younger, like suppose she is 50, 55, then you would like to do surgery, which is an older lady, already 70, 72, 65, 68. Okay, then you would like to maybe send her for radiotherapy because the immediate complications of radiotherapy are less. And doing a surgery in an older woman, the chances of complications of anesthesia, depending on her performance status, sometimes the surgical complications are more, right? So you look at the question, look at what the situation is and accordingly you can choose or if you cannot know what to choose, you can at least put down that these two options are there for your early stage. Right? Then you can write advantages and you can write disadvantages of both complications. Now CA ovary, again that question would be like a, um, you know, like a 50 or 55 year old lady with history of dyspepsia for 7 or 8 months comes to the OP with vomiting and when you examine you find that there is a mass which is a firm you know, irregular mass. So you know how you describe the mass. So when you're writing your clinical features you can write add a little bit of the descriptions depending on what is asked. And uh, investigations of course you would like to do what all investigations you would like to do your routine investigations but when you write you write that I would like to do an investigation to confirm the diagnosis so I'd like to do an ultrasound. Where again, I will look at the uterus, look at the myometrium, endometrium, then look at the ovary, one side, the other side. Look at all those characteristics which will tell you whether it is benign or malignant. So, I'm not going into all those details now. I expect you all to know that. Then you can look at the <coughs> whether there is hydrourethronephrosis, whether there is ascites, whether there is any hepatosplenomegaly. So, all these things you have to look at. You mention all that. Don't just write ultrasound, pelvis and go away. Right? Just points are enough. And um, uh, once you, you have an, then I would also like to do investigations too. She would require surgery. So I would like to do CBC, urinary, RFT, LFT, FBS, PPBS, X-ray, chest, ECG, mm, all those things because from point of view of fitness for anesthesia, also um, I need to control the sugars and, and HB needs to be corrected if required. And then I will post her for a staging laparotomy. Now, before that, would you like to do some other things? Yes, I would like to do tumor markers. And uh, if, if uh, CA125 is elevated, then more likely that she's having a malignancy. Similarly, if it's a large mass, complex mass, I would like to use some other imaging like CECT. So, you would like to do a CECT, which will tell you what. So, when you write CECT, what all you will know from CECT? Don't write all those things as you've written in the ultrasound again. You can write, apart from all the characteristics that we have seen on ultrasound, you get additional information of momental metastasis, hmm? uh, any deposits in the peritoneum, peritoneal deposits, any bowel um, lesions. So, and uh, whether, there, whether, these, uh, whether the mass is adherent to the adjacent planes. So, if you find that the mass is very much adherent to the bowel and there is a loss of fat plane, then the surgical resectability is poor. So, these are the additional information, which is all that you need to write when you write CECT, right? And then you would post for a staging laparotomy. And then steps of staging laparotomy. Just write the, examine the entire abdomen, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever it is that you examine. Then you go ahead, do a THBSO, you do an omentectomy, you do a maximum debulking. So, the peritoneum and all is involved, you remove that. And a lymphadenectomy. And then post up what you will do. So, your incision you have tried, it's going to be a midline vertical incision. And uh, post-op care, unless it is asked, you can just mention that post, you know, it, it may not be, uh, you may not have time to write all that. If they ask about post-op care, you need ERAS guidelines, uh, enhanced recovery after surgery. It's one of the new things. Uh, it can be, I don't know whether it was asked in your surgery papers, it can also be asked in your gynec papers. So, as a short note, or it can it come as a stem for any of these questions where the, initial, the previous question talks about surgery. 
So basically, uh, it's not like olden days where the patient is kept in bed for five days, given only kani for five days, and so on. Instead, uh, you 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 even before the surgery, you uh, you sort of what do you call counsel them, and soon after the surgery, as early as possible, you remove the catheter as early as possible, you ambulate, and as early as possible, you try to restore oral feeds. So all that makes the patient happy and healthy. and the recovery is much faster okay the chances of post op infection you try and discharge also early so this is about enhanced recovery after surgery it can come as a short not for you then for uh, the other question that can be asked for ca over is about chemotherapy right so if the patient what depending on the stage of the disease so whenever you have for all this ca we are we just have about four uh, malignancies right in i mean or ovary endometrium and cervix is what you're going to be asked So for the staging, instead of writing stage one A, one B, one two, and all, you can just have a diagram sort of where you tell us, you know, basically what the stages are and whatever extent. Now, see, endometrium. Now the new staging that has come, there are some twenty, thirty divisions. We don't expect you to know all that, but we need to know the basic thing: what is stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And then in stage one, we need to know like where is the difference. If it is one A, you need not give your regimen therapy, right? So one A with your uh, um, no uh, high risk factors and your molecular uh, molecular biology coming as immunohistochemistry coming as negative, then that patient does not need. So that one A, one A, one B, one, and all you need to know. But beyond that, one A and B you need to know. But beyond that, you don't have to know, know so many details. So it's okay if you don't tell us what three A, B, and C, and all, because more or less the treatment would be. Uh, like on the same lines for those. Okay, so that is what you need to know. See, a cervix also we can draw a diagram. You know, you those in you know, bigger and bigger squares where it is limited to the cervix goes just beyond it, goes beyond it, and then it's all over, right? So you have stage four. So that makes that shows that you know, and it makes your work easier. It makes our work also easier. And if you, if you make our work easier, definitely it translates into more marks, right? Yeah. So uh, the other aspects, primary infertility, uh, primary amenorrhea, and menopause. I think uh, we'll just keep it for the end if there is time. We're already running beyond uh, beyond time. So I think uh, Samra had told me that there were some requests for uh, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, heart disease in pregnancy. So I've just got a few slides about that. Maybe in ten ten minutes we try and cover. Uh, GTN, okay, and the next ten minutes maybe heart disease and pregnancy. So GTN uh, can come as short notes. I don't know whether it will come as a long essay question for you, but various aspects of GTN can be asked as short notes, right? So you have to know GTN properly. It's also important from point of view of your practical exams. So a high dose of form mole, as you all all know, it's a spectrum of proliferative abnormalities of the trophoblast. So Uh, when you have an abnormal conceptus where uh, you don't have much parts of the fetus, you don't have any part of the fetus, or you might have a partial mole with some part of the fetus, and you have the placenta proliferating abnormally, then that's a gestational trophoblastic disease. What you need, why you need to know about this, because although even a benign vesicular mole can metastasize, so even in a benign vesicular mole you can have lung metastasis. and it's an eminently curable cancer okay so if you if you counsel the patient properly and she comes for treatment then you can almost assure 100% cure in most of the women except in the very high risk women so it includes the pre malignant conditions which is the vesicular mole the high dated of mole complete mole and partial mole and the malignant gestational trophoblastic neoplasia okay So the pre-malignant conditions are complete and partial mole, and the malignant conditions you can have invasive mole, you can have chorio carcinoma, which is non-metastatic or metastatic, and the placental site trophoblastic tumor, and that is a totally different entity. Can sometimes come as a short note. What you need to know about placental site trophoblastic tumor is, I mean, you you need to know enough to write a short note, but basically at least you need to highlight that it may. It's often seen after a normal pregnancy rather than after a molar pregnancy. the the hcg levels are not very high like in your chorio carcinoma so low hcg level doesn't mean however that the disease is not uh, not uh, problematic or that the morbidity is low okay so you can, does not correlate well and this is a, a condition where often you need a hysterectomy it might not really respond very well so you, 
if if everything is okay, if all other conditions, family and all completed, we have a lower threshold for doing hysterectomy. So now hydrated formal hydropic degeneration. So you, these are words that you have to write down. Hydropic degeneration and avascularity of the chorionic villi and the strophoblastic proliferation. So this is what characterizes and what this is what makes it look, you know, form those grape-like vesicles. So it's a benign neoplasm of the chorion with malignant potential and around 8% become malignant. So uh, this is the molar pregnancy. You can see all the vesicular structures. Um, Recurrence is common in 1 to 4%. So if a lady has a vesicular mole in this pregnancy, you have to do an early scan and rule out because in around 1 to 4% of cases, she can have recurrence. And if she has 3 V-moles, that's a very high rate of recurrence, almost 100%. Right? Seen in the extremes of childhood, so if a very young lady or a very old person that's more than 40, chances of having a V-mole are more. Uh, in You have the hydropic degeneration in a complete mole. Uh, and you have the trophoblastic proliferation. There's complete absence of blood vessels. Okay, the villus pattern is maintained. There's no fetal tissue at all. And because of all the HCG, you might find that there are thicker lutein cysts in the ovary. Now, 